Allora, prima cosa, um, purtroppo il materiale che vi presento è stato pensato e ricercato in inglese. È un problema se sto seduta, vi vedo che tirate il collo. Uh, e, e, è, è nuovo e quindi non mi fido a tradurlo io stessa, mi affido invece alle cure della grande Laurence, ci sei ancora? Che traduce in perfetto italiano ehm, e quindi se l'inglese è un problema, a parte che lo pasticcerò e lo pasticceremo insieme, eh, prendete le cuffie e poi parlate in qualsiasi lingua eh, voi volete, perché Laurence in realtà è francese e quindi possiamo anche buttarci da quella parte. Eh, vi ringrazio di essere venuti, un grande onore essere qui, questo un posto prestigioso e famosissimo, ringrazio la direttrice, il corpo dirigente, ringrazio la, la giovane eh, eh, generazione che mi ha aiutato fin eh, dall'inizio, saluto la mia amica Luisa Passerini con cui abbiamo fatto cose grandiose nella nostra esistenza eh, e saluto voi, voi tutti che ancora non conosco ma che conoscerò. Vedo un gruppo di persone che entrano, chi siete? No, se in caso mai fosse la direttrice che non... Va bene, allora... Quindi passo all'inglese, eh, vi voglio bene, via. <ride> so what is the problem? Um, allora, qual è il problema? Il problema è un nuovo campo di ricerca che è quello delle nuove scienze umanistiche. Ah, finalmente, benvenuta a tutti. È arrivata Carolina, evviva! <ride> No, 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 io voglio dare il benvenuto a Rosi e ringraziarla di cuore per essere venuta eh, da noi e per parlare di un argomento che è fondamentale e quindi mi perdonate, spero per il ritardo, ma abbiamo aperto la Villa Ceruti e quindi avevamo l'artista Susan Phillips che è qui nel pubblico, grande ammiratrice anche di Rosi. Susan, raise your hand. Sì? Ok. E quindi eccoci qua. So just go. now I should did, did you introduce yourself? No, Ti no, sei presentata? No, oh, appena okay. cominciato. Well, allora è, è dovere mio ringraziare naturalmente oltre a Rosi che è Bradotti che è qui con noi che è una sorta di pop star del pensiero che infonde in noi tantissime tantissime idee, tantissimi spunti. Desidero ringraziare anche um, chi rende possibile questi eventi, cioè noi siamo il Museo della Regione Piemonte, quindi la Regione Piemonte, anche la città di Torino, la città di Rivoli e in particolare per le attività del CRRI, del nostro centro di ricerca nuovo, anche la Compagnia di San Paolo. Rosi Braidotti è nata in Friuli, ha vissuto in Australia e ha ottenuto un dottorato in Francia. Attualmente insegna a Utrecht ed è una delle principali ragioni per le quali le persone vanno ad Utrecht. Um, <ride> è stata direttrice eh, fondatrice del so Center for the Humanities dell'Università di Utrecht um, e direttrice fondatrice della Scuola Olandese di Ricerca in Women's Studies ricercatrice di scuole eh, diverse di scienze sociali dell'Istituto per gli studi avanzati di Princeton, dal, ancora prima, quindi negli anni 90, e eh, nei primi anni 2000 a Firenze, <coughs> ricercatrice. E le è stato attribuito un diploma onorario in filosofia all'Università di Helsinki nel 2007, e eh, tanti altri premi ha ricevuto, è anche cavaliere reale della regina Beatrice dei Paesi Bassi. Adesso possiamo creare il premio della, 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 della regge Sabaude, siamo in una regia Sabauda, quindi possiamo creare un altro cavalierato, e, ed è stata anche... Ehm, membro del MAI, che è il, um, del Consiglio dell'Accademia Europea dal, mille, dal 2014. Però più importanti di questi premi sono da ricordare questi libri e questi titoli impressionanti come Patterns of Dissonance del 91, Nomadic Subjects del 94, poi rieditato nel 2011, Metamorphoses, non Metamorphoses, del 2002, Transpositions 2006, La Filosofia 
là où on ne l'attend pas, en 2009, um, Nomadic Theory, The Portable Rosa Braidotti, qui est ce que spesso si, si legge, um, uh, uh, del, del 2011, almeno la seconda, obviously, edizione, e uh, The Post-Human del 2013 e Post-Human Knowledge del di, recente, del 2019. Uh, insieme al, all'attento pensatore Paul Gilroy ha uh, anche coeditato Conflicting Humanities e con Maria, l'amica Maria Hlavaloiva, The Post-Human Glossary. Quindi passo la parola alla nostra Rosi Braidotti ringraziandola d'anticipo per la sua generosità. Grazie Carolina. Devo dire che Carolina è stata una fan assidua, una grande amica, mi ha, mi ha invitato la prima volta, credo tre anni fa, sì. e abbiamo continuato a cercare un momento, sono davvero veramente felice che sì, siamo arrivati. Ho insistito. Hai fatto proprio bene. E grazie a Caterina, a Molteni, a tutto il team che è stata veramente magnifica nell'aiuto. Allora, cerchiamo di vedere se arriviamo a parlare, Laurence è a posto, riattacchiamo di nuovo con queste um, humanities. So, what is happening around the construction of the human in the humanities. We humanists are not trained to ask the question, what is the human in the humanities? It's not a question that you, we are trained for. When we think of the human, we think of culture, of language, of representation, civilizations, if we are that way inclined. Um, we don't think in terms of species, We don't think in terms of earth. We barely think in terms of bodies, unless you're a feminist or post-colonial or an anti-racist. Um, uh, it is really a pattern of dualistic Cartesian thinking. Uh, the human is man. Man is not an animal um, because it has reason and language. Um, and it is definition by negation. Uh, what I'm trying to argue is that this way of thinking about the human is changing today. And it is changing not for ideological reasons, for critical reasons, it is changing because of historical material reasons. It's changing because of the nature of our economy, the nature of our technology, the nature of our culture. Um, a couple of starting assumptions in case you don't know the rest of my work. The human is not a neutral term. Man is not a universal neutral term. It is a term that indexes access to rights, to entitlements. To be considered human, to have the rights of humans, is in fact a privilege. Vast proportions of the human species are not considered human. Women were not considered human until very recently. Um, natives, non-whites, um, non-Europeans are barely considered humans. In the classification of species of Linnaeus, the animals begin with the African. The cutting off point between humans and animals is the Africans. Linnaeus was a great scholar and a great genius, but the racialization of species is that deeply ingrained in our ways of thinking. And if you look at the literature on hum humanism in humanism, the issue of racialization, sexualization, naturalizations are emerging as axes of reflection around the explosion of the understanding of what was the human. Sorry, Laurence, I'm going off script. But my teacher, Michel Foucault, already in 1962 in Le Mots and Le Chaux was writing, The Order of Things, was writing about the death of man, the death of European humanism. And that death was not a tragedy over an extinction. It was the preface to a new beginning, to a new series of productions of knowledge and new ways of thinking about the human beyond the Eurocentric man of reason, as Genevieve Lloyd coined the sentence. And, uh, so there is, I think this, you will see how the question of death and extinction is written into the script. But from the beginning, let me come out as the affirmative thinker 
neo spinozis Deleuzean feminist affirmation. When something ends, it's not a tragedy. Usually, something new begins. Um, and, 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 and it's this idea that the actual and the virtual, that, that, that what we no longer are and what we are yet in the process of becoming, the tension between these two is at the core of what I would see as a philosophy of science, as a, the temporality of science. Still off script, Laurence, and then I go back to script. This is how Deleuze then continues the work of Foucault. The present is both the record of what we are ceasing to be and the seeds of what we're in the process of becoming. It is the actual, what we no longer are, men, see if I care, and, and what we're becoming, the virtual, which is to be decided, it is an open horizon. The posthuman is such a context. It's a context where we have a convergence between the critiques of humanism, the end of humanism, and the critique of anthropocentrism, anthropos, which takes us people in the humanities by surprise because we do not think with Darwin, we think with Dante, don't we? Given a choice of these is not going to be Darwin, it's not part of how we are trained. And, and the distinction between the two cultures, science and the humanities, is one of the things that is shifting at the moment um, and uh, moving very quickly. There is a chain of theoretical, social, and political effects so complex that it causes a qualitative leap in a new conceptual direction. I would even maybe suggest that we are looking at a change of paradigm. A change of paradigm is both a crisis for some and a source of enormous inspiration and even exhilaration for others. Important to recognize the specificity of posthumanism and post-anthropocentrism. They cross over in the posthuman convergence, but they have different genealogies and very different um, applications in history. You can do critiques of humanism with feminism, with all kind of radical epistemologies, and never confront the issue of anthropocentrism. Inversely, and we will come to this if I get to that part of the talk, in a lot of post-anthropocentric institutes, the example that I would have in mind is the Oxford Institute for the Future of Humanity, based on computational network, based on neural and robotic um, uh, sciences. Dick, Nick, Nick, uh, Nick Bostrom. Um, uh, that institute assumes that thinking today is the prerogative of computational networks. Thinking is done by computers. And that is a problem, isn't it? Because it means that our brain is both less important, but more tragically, it is slower, much slower, eight seconds slower than the computers. And solution for Oxford, accelerate the human brain. Transhumanism, funded to the tunes of millions, ERC projects by Nick Bostrom. And project called super intelligence, human enhancement, potenciamento dell'umano. The single largest um, creative um, cradle of posthuman thinking, and super intelligence, human enhancement. I'm talking about Oxford, not about the local community college. I'm talking about royal science, to quote Gilles Deleuze. And, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of what is happening. You have institutes that are post-anthropocentric, but in the case of Oxford, neo-humanists, because Nick Bostrom believes that what he's doing is totally compatible with humanism. He's listening in. <laughs> Hi. It's in, <laughs> it's in fact the culmination of humanism, the perfectibility of man through science and technology. So Bostrom gives you, if you're a young person looking for grants, this is the dominant paradigm, this is the formula. Analytically, post-anthropocentric, normatively neo-humanist. As Jakovitti would say, patasnyakete. <laughs> and it is a patasnyakete because it's a complete contradiction in terms to displace the human at the analytic level and reintroduce humanism through the back door, 
completely uncritically, no feminist critique, no post-colonial critique, no race critique, the human, the human about which so many of our people are in a panic, and I'll try to give you a quick uh, sense of them later. So it's important to respect the specificity of each uh, and understand that the crossover is creating a certain turmoil. That turmoil is the post-human convergence. It is not happening uh, of course, everywhere in the same way, but we, as a planetary entity called the humans, are all confronting the effects of the post-human convergence, but we are not confronting those effects in the same way or to the same extent. So we here is not a homogeneous category, we is a community that needs to be looked at very critically. Uh, I do the we and the subjectivity of the posthuman with my nomadic subject and um, theory. The we is a heterogeneous assemblage. It is not a unitary subject. It needs to be reconstructed. But the context, the context is crucial. It's a context where we are planetarily caught between the fourth industrial revolution led by robotics, genomics, information technology, nanotechnologies. With these lovely caring robots that are so important in healthcare and the care of the elderly, so neat and so clean and so very, very helpful. I have an honorary grandchild in Copenhagen, he's age 10, and he was given two hamsters for, um, two guinea pigs for um, Christmas. And what does a young Danish boy of 10 call? is guinea pigs that he gets for Christmas. Alexia and Siri. What else do you call them? Um, so what comes first if you're a tell Michel Serre, Petite Poussette, the book Thumbelina, when it says for the kids of today, if something doesn't swoosh, it doesn't exist. This, the brains of these kids are wired dramatically differently from my brain. And an evolutionary leap is definitely ongoing. So the people in Oxford are wasting money wanting to accelerate the human brain. It's happening anyway. Just look at these kids and, and try to pay, play a computer game with these kids and, and be humiliated um, as the member of an older species. Um, speed. So the, the, the proximity with the robot, the cleanliness, but the reality of a much dirtier, more toxic system of production. And f so the fourth industrial revolution, but heavily, heavily uh, uh, coded in terms of labor relations, in terms of exploitation, racialization of the labor force. Very difficult to find images of digital rubbish. And until recently, it was almost impossible. Now the first aerial shots of dead cemeteries of computers have been discovered, mostly, of course, outside the West, um, with children and women dismembering very toxic material. Fourth Industrial Revolution in the middle of the sixth extinction. Fourth Industrial Revolution, I'm quoting Schwab. Sixth extinction, I'm quoting Colbert. At the same time, it's not as if you have the Anthropocene on Monday and robotics on Tuesday. They're happening at the same time. And the, con the convergence of this phenomena is defining our social sphere, our economy, our politics, because a lot of the people who are left behind here are not too happy um, with what is happening. So in stressing the, the simultaneity of these contradictions, I want again to emphasize the importance of looking at what in the early work I used to call the politics of location, the feminist methodology of grounding your state. Look at these conditions from somewhere specific. There cannot be a universalist position on this. It all depends on where you are. This is not relativism. It's imminence, it's politics of location. In the posthuman scholarship, the term that is emerging is perspectivism. It's a matter of perspectives. And, and you will find this in the work of brilliant people uh, like uh, Viviero de Castro with the work on indigenous epistemologies um, or Philippe um, uh, the, what is his name, the, Combe in the, the uh, Collège de France, Chair of Anthropology, Descola, thank you, the animal studies man who says the important thing is to remember that the distinction animal, 
human only exists in the West. Most cultures in the, in the universe don't even have that. Um, so perspectivism, we don't have to go indigenous, although there is a lot to be gained by going that way. We can do this with Spinoza. We can do this with Leibniz. The, or we can do this with contemporary rereading of Spinoza and Leibniz in people like Deleuze, in Serre, the neo-naturalists, the critical neo-naturalism um, that we have learned to read only as a political philosophy and now can be approached at long last as an ontology, as a metaphysics of imminence. Um, Deleuze is one of the great metaphysicians of the 20th century. He gives you an alternative and the alternative is neo-spinosis, perspectivism. It all depends where you are. So immediately I want to do my quarrel with the rhetoric of the Anthropocene, because the Anthropocene has become a sort of a, has a monopoly over these discussions, um, uh, as if the Anthropocene alone could describe the posthuman convergence. It cannot. And my way of sort of showing this is that the Anthropocene is not one, it's become an anthropomeme, and with very many different variations, the capitalocene, of course, the extulocene, anthropocene, anthropocene, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm collecting them, so if you find more, please send them. This type of speeding up, which I, I describe in more details in the book that Carolina kindly already quoted, posthuman knowledge coming out at the end of May, this type of kind of schizophrenia, you take a concept and you spin it, is typical of our times. Nothing stands still. I call it in the new book epistemic accelerationism. And epistemic accelerationism is one of the most difficult elements um, of the contemporary um, uh, climate. There are moments in postmodernism where this is already emerging, but now it's absolutely in your face. Nothing stands still. I will show you what happens with the posthuman uh, in a minute. Um, so uh, the, the, the Anthropocene alone, as important as it may be, is not enough to account for the complexity of the convergence. If you retain anything from today, it's the convergence, posthumanism, post-anthropocentrism. Fourth Industrial Revolution, sixth extinction. Crossovers, rhizomic, complex, completely contradictory. I don't want to be boring, but Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari did subtitle their, their work, Capitalism as Schizophrenia. Fractures, schizoid fractures. And, and it's not science fiction, it's the world that we're living in, working in, and trying to make sense of it. Oh. The mood is not great. The mood is anxiety, melancholia, and a great deal of fear. There's a lot of apocalyptic, and it's not only because of, of the politicians that we're forced to look at. And if I look at some of their faces again, I think I will become very ill. It's not only because of that, um, uh, but, but because it's very difficult to come to terms with the, sort of the, the, the speed and the intensity of the changes. Unsurprisingly, La letteratura dell'ansia, I call it, um, the, the scholarship of anxiety, enormous, very brilliant thinkers. Uh, His Holiness the Pope, an extraordinary letter. Um, I'm not particularly Catholic, but I admire him greatly. We have to protect him because Steve Bannon from his school outside Frosinone has a contract out to, to get rid of the Pope. Uh, Bannon has a school, as you may know, in the mountains outside Frosinone, a big monastery, and he trains the neo-fascists of Europe, and he's allied himself to the right, right-wing branch of the Vatican. And they're very, very open about toppling Papa Francesco and bringing in one of their own. And it was a big report in the Financial Times three days ago. Steve Bannon uses Italy as his base. Outside Frosinone, I propose that we make a massive demonstration. I'll be there if you organize it. Um, uh, <laughs> A lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of sense that something is being taken from us. Um, and and the, the image of the Vitruvian on the Starbucks cup, which you may remember from the posthuman uh, book, is where the, the emphasis on consumption and the reduction of the humanist ideal to a pretext to go shopping, um, I think, um, makes the point very vividly. The structure of contemporary capitalism has taken the consumerism a step further by making as the true capital, do you want the image here? As true capital, uh, 
information about, about life, the extent to which data collection and information is the true capital must be obvious to anybody under the age of 30 sitting in this room. It's about collecting data. If you still have your Facebook page, you shouldn't, but if you still do, you know that you've made Mark Zuckerberg a very wealthy man. Um, he, data collection, um, retrieval of information, profiling, and this is happening across the board. Um, and it's happening not only in the banality of our social life, it is happening in the scientific world, where genomics and, and uh, al genes and algorithms are the codes that run our existence. And production, retrieval, and transformation of data is the capital, is what matters, is the only form of productivity that matters, data mining. And intervention on the structure of living matter. Mm -hmm. I will give you a first example from um, biogenetics. There's nothing to see, of course, um, because that's the problem with genetic transformation. There is nothing to see. A big challenge for the artist. Some of the most boring exhibitions I've ever seen are bio art. You go there and they, and they show you a glass. Here is genetically recombined DNA. You think, oh, interesting, just a glass, right? <laughs> so I think you have a real challenge to um, put genes and algorithmic culture into some sort of form of representation. This is artificial meat, the first synthetic hamburger constructed in 2013 at the University of Maastricht from st originally stem cells. Um, um, but after that, it was completely uh, sort of cloned and became its own thing. First prototype cost $325,000. The recent price is $11 per synthetic hamburger. Now, I don't know whether we have, of course, we, can st we, can, we cannot taste it yet. The proteins are in place. The nutritional value is in place. Our brains are not wired. Our neural system is not wired to taste it. In comes Nick Bostrom from Oxbridge, is going to rewire our brain, and soon we will be able to taste it. Now, I don't know how many vegans um, we have in the room or how many vegetarians. But if you were vegan vegetarians, wouldn't you? Maybe vegans not because it's about the abolition of meat. Imagine you're just vegetarian. Wouldn't you be happy that we have artificial meat? Does this not solve a number of problems? We no longer need to torture animals to produce la bistecca quotidiana. Um, we, we, we can feed the masses of the world, reduce the incredible pollution that cattle causes. Isn't that a cause for celebration? So why, every time I show this image, why do people look so depressed and slightly, as my mother would say, schifati? <laughs> <laughs> or let me put it this way, what do we miss when meat emancipates itself from the animal? Quando la bistecca si emancipa dalla bestia, cosa ci viene a mancare? And the term that comes up in the literature is eco-nostalgia. It was so much better before when bistecca were bistecca, men were men, and women knew their place. <laughs> John Wayne, John Wayne, it's a quote from John Wayne. Fascistone. <laughs> what do we miss when something that we never cared for, nature, suddenly disappears? Because I think that emotion, that affect, Eco-nostalgia is terribly important, even for the radical fringe, even for the most advanced, a sense of where are the landscape of our youth? Dove sono i gelsi? O come direbbe Pasolini, dove sono finite le lucciole? Le, the epistemological breaks, um, uh, or the, the disappearance of the fireflies. Uh, the, hold on to it. I believe that there is something extremely important going on there. I can't do much with it. Just highlight it, hold on to it. We need to look at eco-nostalgia very, very seriously, because even I, radical um, uh, feminist and um, uh, or environmentalist have difficulties um, with the idea of synthetic biology. And, and it shows up in reproduction, it shows up in agriculture. We have, of course, the tomatoes. Uh, I live in Holland, so tomatoes taste like cauliflowers, so it makes no difference. But um, uh, the idea that what we used to call food and nutrition is a matter of genetic recombination, biologically, synthetically produced. 
why is this not something that we can immediately get excited about? I know Torino Gastronomical Capital, a Michelin restaurant opposite. There's, there's multi-layer, a thousand plateaus of eco-nostalgia. It may be one of the sources of the sadness of our times, a very deep and to a certain extent unconscious affect. Something is missing here, something that we didn't even know that we really cared for. Nothing worse, actually, than that. Okay, this is happening in cognitive capitalism. Uh, just a quick summary. Um, with capital today, the informational power of living matter. Profits generating from the scientific and, eco and economic comprehension of all that lives. Biopiracy. Vandana Shiva already in the 90s. It's about biopiracy. <laughs> it's about absolutely looting. Uh, the genetic code of all that lives. You do know that Monsanto, now reacquired by Bayer, if I'm not mistaken, owns the genetic code of all the grains, of most of the grains on Earth. It means that if you want to buy those grains, to use those grains, you have to buy them back from Monsanto. Recently, two very bright Dutch scientists, scholars, um, cloned the, the, the genetic code of the grain that Ethiopia has been producing for thousands of years. A legal case erupted between the government of Ethiopia and the Dutch University that actually own the genetic code of this grain. Very interesting challenge for the legal profession. Um, law and jurisprudence are really at work about giving rights to things. Um, uh, giving rights not only to animals, we have had the, the, the a couple of decades of animal rights arguments. But right now, the government of Venezuela has given legal rights to rivers. And we have Costa Rica giving legal rights to forests. Non-humans legal agents are a reality in the legal profession because the law has to deal with reality. Philosophy can pretend that we're still in the 17th century. The legal profession cannot and nor can the medical profession. At the University of Utrecht, anatomy lessons are done with computer simulations. Nobody sees bodies anymore. The dematerialization of bodies into data is cognitive capitalism, which means that knowledge is produced to a very large extent outside the university or in combination with partners outside the university. Where are we today, ladies and gentlemen? One of the most brilliant art museums in Europe. <laughs> More than an art museum, it's a center for reflection and criticism. Cognitive capitalism, which is us. It's not an, I'm not a Marxist, it's not an alien element, it's not the enemy. It's a mode of production where knowledge is external to the institutions which historically have been the producers of knowledge. And if you look at the contemporary university, our colleagues in IT or in genomics next to their departments have little factories or workshops attached to it. Stem cell research back to back with the university uh, hospital, running from the hospital to the laboratory, creating new life forms um, and then immediately patenting them, the patenting system biopiracy, uh, and pi patents earn a fortune for traditional universities. A university that can patent a new cell, a new life form, a new whatever makes a lot of money. There's one area of the university that never has any patents, the humanities and the social sciences. We do not produce patents. Um, we use ordinary language to do extraordinary things, but we cannot patent language. So one of my proposals would be, let's start patenting every new term that we invent and, and put a tax on it and put that money into education for arts and science and proper things. And let's make money by claiming that we are the artisans of language and, and that the life matter that we use is this living matter. The problem is patenting it is really difficult. Uh, but it's, uh, the attack on the humanities and social sciences is part of the um, 
the agenda of cognitive capitalism. The argument is we don't make money, we just spend it. And Utrecht University last year made a, sm a small profit. Public university cost a thousand euro to enroll at Utrecht University. Our profit last year was 42 million euros. It's public information, it is on the website of the university. Go through the university and check their budgets. And most of them would have amazing profits in certain areas, in connection with partners in society, cognitive capitalism. It's a new system. People call it the new economy. Welcome to the post-human convergence. I'll go quickly over the inhuman part. Everything comes from the military. Most of the technology comes from war. The battle between China and the United States today is about how much new robotic machinery do we put into the new wars. Occasionally, you will get some reports in the Financial Times or in some of the conservative journals. Very difficult to get the info, uh, but most of our technology is a recycle of the military. And it's a recycling of, um, and here we have, of course, our drones, um, non-human. This is post-human warfare. You know how it works shot for thousands of kilometers away by video players and usually teenagers, totally privatized. We do not know how the, the warriors, soldiers um, uh, are trained. We don't know what the consequences, but the necropolitical machinery is absolutely central to a, a culture that makes money on life forms, on smart things, on live um, objects, is also a culture that is reinventing death and is allowing entire sectors of the population to die, to not stay afloat, um, to simply not make it. We are reducing them to social problems. I want to talk about this because there's a whole, and I will not go further, there's a whole area of posthuman scholarship that is about death. Um, uh, and I think of the work of Achille Mende, but um, there's a, a, a lot of the, of the feminist groups, um, and of course all the migration issue, and the xenophobia, and the new fascism, the singles out. Uh, the refugees, um, uh, whereas the issue here is a new form of global mobility that intersects with the sixth extinction. Um, and it's a much broader issue. We're looking at 65 million refugees in the world. This is not a problem. This is a change of paradigm. Um, this is a new regime of mobility that we need to look at very, very carefully. Okay, this is the cartography. My time is already up, but see if I care. Uh, Post-human knowledge tries to deal with it and try, accepts that we have a certain s sort of shift of perspective and we need to deal with it. And there are enormous differences in the different forms of, of humanism. I told you before, epistemic accelerationism. Here you have it. It will all come in the book, but you can take your photos. Um, uh, look at the dates. We're looking at the last five, six years. Um, uh, an enormous, enormous um, variation, so big that I'll skip the feminists, otherwise we'll never get out of it. Uh, the posthuman glossary, uh, this you must take a picture of, great. Um, uh, together with Maria, um, very, very important. It was together with the Contemporary Art Center of Utrecht, Maria Levayova, very well known to all of us, an incredible curator, um, an incredible figure who believes in the powers of critical thinking and the alliance between the arts and the university, between critical theory, philosophy, and the artistic practice, fundamental. We put a lot of money, um, research money, into making it um, glossier for our artists. There's a lot of artists in it. Uh, 97 contributors, 103 entries, most of them neologisms. Um, and I took care of a feminist uh, rhizome through it and an LBGT rhizome through it. But you have to go and look into it and find Rosie's rhizomes. Um, and the rest is pretty bizarre, weird stuff. Um, um, Morton and the others are not wrong in saying weirdness is part of the picture. Uh, but so is very, very serious institutional answers. I told you about Oxford already. Um, I will go quickly over that. Cambridge replied with the creation of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which assesses the risks created by what Oxford is doing, so they keep each other employed, they're always doing that. Uh, the Swedes did uh, things differently. Linköping has the Posthumanities Hub, we just moved to Stockholm. All of these are funded 
na by the national research councils. And Lin Chuping are our allies, and I'll show you later why. The Germans, the Anthropocene got 50 million euros, and the technosphere got 60 million euros. They've been at it for about eight, nine years. And Haus de Culture de Verde, and the German National Deutsche Museum, uh, Rachel uh, uh, Carson Center, go and have a look at their website and marvel. 300 PhD grants they gave out to study Anthropocene posthuman issues. What will come out of it, we do not know. But um, it's really interesting. Um, Canada, the first national research grants that I know of, um, uh, it broke outside Toronto Posthuman Research Center. Arouse, um, our different ways of being human, um, again, funded. Um, new journals, they, all the roads seem to lead to Korea. I wonder why that is. Um, posthuman studies, transhumanities, critical posthumanities. I know of two other journals on the posthuman that have just been created since. I will add them for the next um, uh, phase. On the one hand, great vitality. On the other hand, um, a bit of concern about the proliferation uh, of terminology. But what the points in common are is the recognition that something has shifted that the subject of knowledge cannot just be the human brain reduced to this black box. You need to look at transversal subjectivities, interconnections, in my, in my old language, nomadic subject constructions that reach out and make it possible to think of knowledge as a collaborative effort that requires human, non-humans, um, requires air and water, safety, funding, and all of that. Um, not all of the forms of humanism, posthumanism, reject classical humanism. Many re-elaborate it, very diversified. And if there is a message I wanted to launch, really, in reaction to the transhumanist, which is the same thing as the Silicon Valley ethos of transhumanism, is keep this field open. Allow the diversity of positions. Um, from the, the weirdest, most experimental, non-profit ways of becoming posthuman, Bjorg uh, included, here the artist again, the writers, um, um, to the most profit-oriented ones and everything in between. Do not preempt the, the outcome of this transformation process. Allow the people, the citizens, the time to decide what we could become, because this transformation is exciting and wonderful, and at the same time, very scary and, 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 and very dangerous in so many ways politically. You see what kind of political climate that we are already in. Let's not make it worse. My proposal, if I can have the next six hours, um, <laughs> Five minutes. The building blocks that I would propose start from, I skip this part, the, what, what I call the critical studies generation. And this is already a little bit in the fourth chapter of the posthuman, but it comes big in the next book. We need to understand that for areas of thinking, since the 1970s, critiquing man and preferring the company of animals has been a prerogative of many radical groups. And one of the definitions of um, uh, feminism by Rebecca West is, the more I know men, the more I appreciate animals, which is a really a lovely one. There is a tra long tradition in feminism, post-colonialism, race theory of women, blacks, LBGT, marginal people, allying themselves with animals, robots, extraterrestrials, anything rather than the hegemony of patriarchal man. And the alliance of the marginals, it's a, it's a topos in feminist science fiction from way back, and it's coming up big in contemporary forms of accelerationism and, and, and radical, um, um, and radical uh, posthumanism. Obviously, if you've never read one line of gender or queer theory or of, of post-colonial theory, it may come as a shock to you, but then have you been under a rock for the next 30 years? Um, what has happened to you? For many of us who come from these radical epistemologies, it's a next step. The next step is the second generation of studies coming around after the Cold War, more or less, where you get 
critical animals. My favorite is critical plant studies. It's my favorite for today. Uh, Deakin University, Melbourne. What I'm giving you here is, uh, I wish I had the imagination to make this. These are all names, titles of programs. Uh, it, it, they're empirically grounded textual exercises. And um, they all exist. Uh, green studies is, is enormous. Uh, but it goes on. Um, at, the, at the moment, I think it's critical management studies that is my favorite. Um, celebrity studies. It's splinters. This is where I, I've written another paper, uh, which is not uh, for today, on specifically on uh, epistemic accelerationism. You will find it in theory, culture, and society. A theoretical framework for the post-humanity, where I look specifically at the way in which things just go on a spin, and all of a sudden we have FET studies, uh, celebrity studies, I think we probably have Chelsea Manning studies. We certainly do have in new media post-Snowden studies um, already. Um, remember when we had media? I mean, I remember theater studies. I mean, I'm that old. I remember theater studies. Then media studies comes in. Lo and behold, we studied television and cinema. That was a battle. <laughs> then new media comes in, and we look at games and internet now. Internet studies, software, so a critical code, algorithmic studies, and somebody told me two days ago, algorithmic cultural studies, Goldsmiths College, Patasnyakete again. Yeah, it, that requires a Patasnyakete, I think. Um, the inhumane aspects have created their own. The winner of this sequence is death studies. Look at Bristol University, amazing programs covering multiple ways of dying. If you ever want to do something on new ways of dying, I'm in. Um, the, I think new approach, the biopolitical includes the necropolitical. You cannot do one without the other. What we used to call death as the horizon, as splintered into a multiplicity of ways of dying, youth suicide at the highest since the 1930s, burnout, exhaustion, um, uh, way out of all proportion, the use of psychopharmaceutics. Some people talk, Preciado talks about psychopharmaceutic capitalism. Um, uh, there are multiple ways of dying, and of course, the people dying in the Mediterranean trying to get to us. These are the building blocks for the critical posthumanities. And the critical posthumanities are a step further, a quali qualitative leap, whereby all of a sudden, from having gender studies, animal studies, critical plant studies, we get the environmental humanities. Immediately splitting, it's capitalism and schizophrenia, remember, into blue humanities that study the sea, and green humanities that study the earth. I'm sure that will break down into others again. Uh, organic, greatest, all of these are distributed. I think uh, most of the Ivy Leagues go for the environmental, but you will find variations. Huge medical humanities, um, uh, civic humanities, um, uh, and uh, oh, there's already meta discourse, digital humanities, neuro evolutionary humanities. What struck me about this phenomenon is that these new configurations of power call themselves humanities. They do not call themselves studies, specifically not. And what the other thing that strikes me about them, if you look at Stanford, for instance, or Duke, or Edinburgh, is that these new humanities get all the funding get all the research funding. And, and I think if you were a humanist or somebody, you wonder about what exactly is going on here. Discourses about the new post-humanities, again, look at the dates, really, apart from Hales, who is a, um, an, a pioneer of the digital humanities. Uh, post-humanities invented by Wolf, not 2010. Critical post-humanities misspelled. Nomadic humanities, I didn't even think of that. Kate Stimson thought of that. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, I missed that one. Uh, already meta discourses about what is happening to the humanities. Already theorizations of what is going on here. Not only is man no longer the subject of knowledge. Not only is anthropos very central to our uh, knowledge production practices. Not only do we have the, the digitization, dematerialization of bodies, but we have new institutional formations that claim that whatever they do is the humanities. Um, and in, if you look at what they do, the humanities are usually a tiny little sector and is usually reduced to something that they call bioethics, God forbid. 
uh, whatever that is. But in any case, it's something that needs to be empirically uh, studied. Um, I tried, but I didn't get the grant. Um, the grant for the posthuman went to Oxford because that is the, that is the format. Um, uh, I am not normatively a neo-humanist. I am very much normatively a post-humanist. Um, uh, and and, 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 and uh, anal analytically and normatively, I want to change at a qualitative level. I think we need a new ethical system to deal with this, not the good old moral system. Um, so, so the idea of actually transforming our understanding of what we do as human is um, crucial for me. And here we go. Critical posthumanities assume all of this. I would say we need neither the humanism nor the anthropocentrism, but a more complex, embodied, embedded, non-unity, relational, and affective. It's become like a mantra, embodied, embedded, relational, and affective. Uh, collaboratively linked to a material web of human and non-human agents, but we still need a subject. This is where I disagree respectfully with Bruno Latour and the object ontologists. We can't just dismiss subjectivity. We need a subject in order to carry on the work of managing this transition, managing this convergence, making sure that we don't leave too many people behind. Because if you look at the configuration, there are many missing people. I did not find in my surveys non-nationally indexed humanities. In fact, in an era of populism, in an age of illiberal flirtation with fascism, national humanities are stronger than ever. Orban in Hungary immediately took over the, the, the curriculum of the humanities history. And Poland, and the, taking over the curriculum is the first thing the fascists do. And then they tell their side of the story, which is always the same, the triumph of nationally indexed values, and depreciation of women, lynching of LBGT, killing of refugees, always the same story. Homicidal, and, uh, absolutely phantasmatic, really, really dangerous. I did not find in their reality feminist and queer humanities. We have the text, we don't have the institutional. Black humanities, migrant diasporic, Poor trailer park humanities, I owe this um, to Richard Rorty, 1998, beautiful text by Richard Rorty about the poor whites, saying the academy is in love with the margins, critical theorists only do post-colonial race theory, we have forgotten the poor whites, 1998, um, the poor whites are going to be, feel, could be feeling totally dispossessed and left behind, in despair, they will turn to a strong man that will promise them solace. The future of America is fascism. Richard wrote in 1998. Um, go and look it up. The book was out of stock. They promised to reprint it after the victory of Trump. I haven't seen it, admittedly, but I have a copy. Um, decolonial, a child humanity, otherwise disabled humanities. These are still missing. And these people are the usual suspects. It's always the same that are missing. And they are not being included in the re-territorialization of knowledge of the post-humanities. So I think that's what we need to do. Planetary, differential, post-humanity. Bringing in indigenous, environmental, the, the crossovers. Indigenous, environmental, and digital. Post-colonial green. Sandra Ponzanesi in Utrecht is doing already some of this work. Decolonial futures of digital media. Transnational, environmental literature. Queer neo-humanism if you want to be a neo-humanist. Indigenous knowledges and cosmologies because we are in this together, but we are not one and the same. Planetary, differential posthumanities give us the chance and we will rock. Thank you. In this planetary future of a subject that still exists and yet that accepts the non-centrality of the anthropos or of the human, but yet is a subject. Uh, it is also the, um, the voice of Rosi Braidotti that ushers in a kind of declamatory possibility. I, uh, it's, it's true. I, I, so I wanted to um, open the floor to questions, but before, 
to think about what this de declamation, which has a performativity to it. So um, coming from art, I mean, I, I'm not a theoretician. I, I don't write books of theory. However, in my work, uh, we have been parallel in a way, in, in the sense that the Documenta 13 in 2012 was very much a claim not to um, only decent, de decenter the human in looking at perspectives that were non-human, and the strange thing is that that came about in a very so-called human environment, which is the environment of, of art making. Uh, it came out in the work of Pierre Huyghe in his composting in the, in the park. It came out in the work of some feminists that were not particularly looked at at the time, but like Christina Buch, who had made this garden for the butterflies in front of the Neue Galerie, where the plants were brought in in, in order to be of interest to particular butterflies. And <clears throat> the audience of the piece were actually the butterflies although that was not particularly uh, reviewed by the human eye and the human texts that were written around the documenta. But there, um, what, I, what I recognize with you is the wanting to not uh, center onto one subject. I mean, in accelerationism and the performativity of your speech tends to function in, in a, as a counter-accelerationism a counter-accelerationism that allows for the meshing of the different perspectives that you are always going from one to another. So the perspective of necropolitics was certainly a perspective of the document. I mean, we were looking at the, um, through the looking at the destruction of art objects in, during wars, it was really uh, also looking at a new emergent economy around, around death itself which seemed apparently to not have no relation whatsoever with the whole question of um, the anthropocentrization. I never used the word Anthropocene. I always found it extremely anthropocentric because as my friends, you know, biologists and so on say, the planet will be fine even if the human is completely extinct. It will take very little time and the planet will be fine. So to say that it's an ecological era in that sense is a, is, a, is a hubris of one species that fears having dragged down other species and, and disappearing, but it certainly wouldn't be the end of this incredible planet with its incredible vibrancy. So in the meshing of the two narratives, the narrative about the destruction of, of art uh, objects and the perspective of the objects that are being destroyed as a metaphor also of necropolitics, so bodies, in Syria and so forth. There was the meshing of that with the critique of, uh, um, of, of what other people call the Anthropocene. So <clears throat> I, my question to you is, um, my first question is, what will this bring to? I mean, the performativity of speech ushers in enthusiasm. People are full of enthusiasm and ushers in people in engaging in studies in universities in counter narratives that are not the Oxford narrative. But when you think about how the dust will settle in 50 years, you know, I mean, Foucault said, of course, the human, like on the beach, disappears at the end of the book, that beautiful book. And <clears throat> we are now 50 years after, and he didn't know about the digital revolution at the time. And now you're very much in it. So how do you think this dust will settle? I mean, you, you don't have a Donna Harawayan perspective on a kind of post-human vision of a, of a cyborg, uh, cyborg alliance with dogs and, and robots. You have a different view. So what will be, in, in what way is the dust settling? Uh, and I ask this question also to Hito Steyer, whose exhibition is on now. And you, you went to see it, oh, wonderful, wonderful. And um, she has, um, uh, uh, she didn't answer. Uh, so she, she has a um, critical antagonistic perspective. And she said the only thing we can do to, to somehow put wrenches in the system of the algorithmic society is to ask the algorithm the question, to answer the question, 
how many angels can dance on the tip of a needle, which is a medieval question. So she didn't answer it, but, but maybe you have some vision, because the people who were putting out the visions in, in a very populistic way, uh, as counter-narratives to the nationalisms, are actually uh, very simplistic. I mean, Yuval Harari tells you, this is what's gonna happen. The planet will have the same population as when agriculture was born 10,000 years ago or whenever. Uh, the, the ecology will be fine and there will be the Übermensch, this Homo Deus, and you better get into the game or you're gonna be part of the dead people. So what does it mean that you don't want to propose a vision but you want to propose a counter-accelerationist per performativity? write all of that to me because I, <laughs> I haven't uh, thought about it in those terms, but I think it rings absolutely uh, true. So um, uh, yes, uh, the, the style uh, is, is not uh, an addition, it is, it is integral to the exercise. Um, and what the exercise is, is to present a, a, a cartography. A cartography, I've been doing cartographies of my life, the cartographic method is how I've always worked. And um, that's how, how, I, how I learned it from my teachers back then in the Sorbonne and, and Foucault's way of doing knowledge and power. It is always about knowledge and power. And tracking the formations of knowledge and power is what I do. And it took me on journeys, zigzagging, it's never linear, it's always rhizomic and zigzagging. Um, from classical philosophy to feminism, and through the feminist teachers that I had, Jenny Law and Lucy Rigere, and all the people I had the fortune of working uh, with. I even met Simone de Beauvoir, so you can come wow. and, and touch my hand. I touched God. <laughs> well, I'm that generation. But, but in a sense, you are driven to encounter certain object or reflection as part of a project. And my project is tracking knowledge and power. And the decline of man, the decline of patriarchy was evident to any baby boomers. Um, and it's even obvious today when I think patriarchy is truly dead and that's why it's so dangerous. Um, but, um, and it was then through exploring the variations of forms of feminist queer LGBT thinking that I saw the explosion of works on the human. It's really what Deleuze says, you encounter certain ideas. It's relational. In a sense, you stumble upon them. But there is a political economy to it. There is a logic to the madness and in tracking certain formations. When I look back now, I could say all of my cartographies all along were about tracking the explosion of the human. Because feminism, the great passion of my life, intellectual and political, is not just about women. If you have not understood that feminism is for everybody, we have really been working for nothing for the last 30 years. It's about a change of parameters. It's about a change of what we mean by humanity, by human, by justice, by earth. It's an ontological shift. It changes just about everything. Um, that's the aspiration, whether you read Sojourner Truth, uh, or whether uh, you read Bell Hooks, or whether you read The Great Simone, it's about that. Um, so, so there is, retrospectively, you can introduce linearity, but as you go, you are driven towards multi-layered direction. Non-linear thinking has been the challenge for my entire generation. That's, we come after psychoanalysis, we come after phenomenology, and we come after the end of rationalism in some ways, and finding ways to have complexity, multiplicity, and yet rigor has been my challenge. And I've done my best, but uh, it's hard work. And, and trying to write it clearly, ha. Huh? Write it um, without jargon, ha. Huh? Because when you use ordinary language to do extraordinary thing, they accuse you of using jargon. And when a chemist uses a chemical former, it's just a good chemist using rigor. And really, there's a, an issue here with the humanities that is very, very deep. Uh, there is another level to the to the uh, your wonderful point about the the performative acceler counter accelerationism. I try to hit out at people, and some people have described my lectures as you are reaching out, and you bet that I am down to the patasnyakete. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to. I don't know you, and I don't know who you are. And I love your being here. I don't want you to waste your time. 
I want to make sure that you go home with something. So I throw all kinds of things. And this is exactly how Gilles Deleuze used to teach. People say Gilles Deleuze is difficult. He's not. He has the same idea, and then he unfolds it in a number of a thousand plateaus in music, in anthropology. But it's the same basic ideas, the ontology, process ontology of becoming. But whether you are, uh, if you, a thousand plateaus is written, you know, the, the memoirs of a sorcerer, the memoirs of a Spinoza, memoirs. I mean, memoirs. Just think what that is, even means. Trying to reach out, um, uh, trying to give bits to as many of you as possible, because I think that the affective touch is what intelligence is all about, is what triggers the thinking process. And last but not least, and I think you were hinting at that um, with the second question, what's mm -hmm. to be done question, to be affirmative, to break bad news in a manner that doesn't contribute to the general depression. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is, if one is a public intellectual, if one is paid by taxpayers' money to read and teach, which is my fortune and privilege, I feel I have an ethical obligation to uplift you, put wings on your feet, and make you want to go home singing. <laughs> and if not, I feel that I failed um, my task. Um, and affirmation is not stupid optimism. It is a profound encouragement to Think through things that make you sick. Um, I train myself to think about populism. I can even look at Salvini now, two and a half minutes, then I vomit. Um, <laughs> but it's two and a half minutes, and it's, I'm building up. You know, soon I'll be able to actually look at him. Um, uh, build up the resistances. This is how Spinoza does the ethics. When Spinoza in the ethics talks about um, the, the, the sadnesses, the, the negative passions, he describes them as poison. Um, and of course, you know that Spinoza lived through a massive political crisis, um, the end of the Dutch Republic. Talk about our political crisis. It's a picnic in relation to what Spinoza went through. Everything came tumbling down. Um, assassinations, it was a terrible time. And he withdraws and he writes the ethics, which is about processing negativity. Affirmation is not optimism. Optimism is Gwyneth Paltrow and the stupid optimism of advanced capitalism. Affirmation is a way of processing pain, of thinking things that really resist, that make you sick, the poison. If you're taking on the world, you're taking on the poison. Uh, today more than ever, how much can you take? It's Spinoza's question. How much can you take? Train yourself to take more of it. Take, it's building up the immunity and affirmation is the way in which you do this. And, uh, Esposito does something similar with, with the question of um, antibodies and, and immunity systems, but it takes it in a different direction. Build up the resistances. Construct affirmation by thinking adequately about the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. So the affirmative comes in there, and my hope is that after mm -hmm. this people will come up with different cartographies and different readings of the situation. Yeah. So I haven't answered the second question, but it's already one. Uh, do you want to add something? No, 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 go, ahead. go uh, ahead. No, I was just thinking about how the affirmative attitude is indeed a feminist attitude. I mean, uh, Karen Barad is affirmative. Uh, Lynn Margulis was very affirmative. Wonderful woman. Yeah. And so it is true that when we look at the critique of the issue, situa environment, for example, if there is a sad one, it's Timothy Morton. Sad. So th there is, there are very many Autistic. sad, uh, very many sad views, and in a way, the populistic books of Yuval Harari are also extremely tragic books. I mean, so there is this um, well, my tradition of affirmativeness. Of, my working definition of fascism is drawn from uh, or authoritarianism is drawn from Deleuze. It is, first of all, simplifications but a, a sense of impossibility, the sadness of the soul, la tristesse de l'âme, um, is how Deleuze used to do The sense that nothing is possible, that the horizon is closed, that everything is played out, um, which is how intelligent people receive authoritarianism. Um, the ones who are seduced by authoritarianism see it as a solution. Oh, I don't know what to do, but he knows, um, let him deal with it. My answer to what needs to be done is that we need to do very simple and highly complex things. Mm. We need to reconstruct political subjectivities. We need a we. 
who, if we say we need to intervene in the debate on artificial intelligence and make sure that disabilities and anomalies, deviations are part of the script, are allowed. Who but, is yeah. the we? Who is in it? Because you can't take this for granted when the entire Silicon Valley ethos is perfectibility, transhumanism, human enhancement, which means selections, or as Fukuyama puts it, soft eugenism. Very cute. Soft eugenism. Thank you, boys. I know who is going to go to those camps. I'm a member of the gay bourgeoisie. I know who's going to go first. We've been there before. So I know who you're going to select in and out. Don't give me that crap. We need to intervene. We need to be empowered to act. Being empowered to act is Spinoza's definition of ethical affirmation. Empower us to act. We need to empower ourselves. It's not going to come from anywhere. In Marxist Hegelian dialectics, the power to act comes from opposition. And this is why so many of our friends, Hito is one, Maria Lavajovic is another, are really vetero communists. They, real, they really want Marxism back because the opposition gives you the energy. I'm against. And by being against, tuck, you get the energy to then rebel. Yeah. There is nothing wrong yeah. with rage and anger. The problem is they are simply short-lived political passion, but there's nothing wrong with them. I'm very happy when people get angry, better than get depressed. But it is not a sustainable political passion. Um, serious determination, endurance um, is one. Um, uh, desiring otherwise, um, laughter for that matter. If, how people get irritated when you have a good laugh. I've had people saying to me, what is there to laugh about? I'm just sitting here with a friend having a good laugh. Uh, nothing is more irritating in pre-fascist time than people who actually are having a good time. The imaginary is apocalyptic. Um, uh, Neo-fascism is apocalyptic. Thousands of refugees, it's down to a trickle. We have no refugees coming. Um, the apocalypse, um, Anthropocene, I mean, Timothy Morton and the, uh, the sky is falling. Um, a white male crisis that makes my Aboriginal friends in Australia laugh. Um, and that's another action. Alliances transversal across the board. One of the great areas of activism today is alliances with land rights, First Nation people, the ones who know about survival because they've gone through it, through colonialism, and they have endured. The, the Aboriginal Studies chairs in Australia that I have worked very closely with in British Columbia, and people who are fighting the building of the pipelines, at the same time defending the First Nation people land, at the same time defending the earth, and at the same time defending a post-human vision of a political subject. Multiple things that we can do, but we need to start by understanding that we need to shake off the sense of impossibility. We have been stung by poison, the poison of the negative. We need to wake up and really get moving. A thousand plateaus of possible action. And ultimately, to the governments and to the politicians, a social democratic message. The people need to be consulted about human enhancement. I am not against the technologies in that sense. Of course not. Of course um, I not. love them. I don't think it's reasonable to imagine that any of us will shut down our phones or will teach without a laptop. They're here to stay. Cognitive capitalism, say no, it's us. It's the best of our brains. It's the best of our university. It's the best of the possible worlds we have made. Within that world, we need to be consulted. We need to actually have a say. We need to accept that some people will not want to be enhanced. And, that, and in disability studies, this movement is very, very strong. Disability studies is one of the line of opposition to all of this saying, I actually am other. No. But I think it's that empower us to act. Um, uh, that sounds Christian, but it's not. Spinoza was <laughs> not. Um, uh, and, and, and alliances across the board and, and breaking down this fragmentation in the sense of the impossible. An antibiotic shot. Mm, okay. Uh, I would, is there anyone who would like to jump in and in ask a language. question? In English. Since, since uh, Ro Rosie, first of all, so many thanks. You have gone such a long way. Uh, I, I, I do recognize the origins of all this, but I am also uh, sort of elated by how much you have done and, and seen and thought of. And I appreciate especially 
the effective part in all this. I mean, the double presence of sadness and uh, exhilaration. Mm. And this speaks to me in the sense that I would have many, many questions of sort of a theoretical, mm, sort, I, I speak from an old position. That's Not fine. only because I'm old, but because my, uh, my heritage is, is, comes from the past. And so I, all the time while Rosie is speaking, I think of what would she think of the idea of the old idea of subjectivity divided into two, the agents, the actual workers in Marxist thought, and the subjectivity, the false subjectivity of the enormous automaton, capital. What about this new capital, this cognitive capital? Is it still a form of even more so from what you say, it is an enormous automaton with, in, in, a, in a new way, in a very uh, sort of um, digital, computerized way, and therefore perhaps more, more powerful. And questions like, you know, or what's the difference between the positionality as in the, ter the terminology used by Spivak and perspectivism? If, you know, questions like coming, as I say, from the past, or even, one thing that all the time I've been thinking of is Im immanence is very present in your talk. Im it's, it's also immanent subjectivity to some extent, but, and that is why it's new, but in my formation, so the subject was always transcendent. There was always this question of trans the subject being linked Outside. to transcendence. Mm -hmm. And so all these questions, but perhaps what I really want to say is not all this old stuff, but something else, that in my work with uh, refugees and migrants, migrants who don't want to be called migrants, uh, mobile people, nomadic people, I think that what I came out with is that, this was a research, interviews, oral and visual memory and so on, is that there is already something going on which justifies uh, the optimism. In spite of the mm. terrible things that are happening, in spite of the terrific tragedies in the Mediterranean and elsewhere, there is something going on which is exchange, which is intersubjectivity of some sort, which is uh, new forms of, uh, of, of exchange. And of this is very, is you, you almost cannot see it. It's almost invisible because that you cannot see in, medi in mediatic language, in mediatic uh, uh, performance. It's, it's, it's in interstices, and still you feel it. it it's uh, it's, it's in, in talking to people, in seeing people, and in spite of the xenophobia and racism, which is, I mean, you can see it and hear it every day in this country. In, you go through the streets, but you also see can perceive something else. For instance, in schools. Sorry for being so long. I Shall I quickly answer? <laughs> sure, of course. Thank you so much. Luisa Passerini and I have known each other for many, many years at the European Institute and uh, everywhere. The new capitalism, um, an incredibly interesting area of research. Um, a lot of new work that I divide uh, with how you, how you want to approach power. You can do power as potestas, Power as potential, power as negative, power as affirmative. A lot of interesting work on all the negative aspects of cognitive capitalism. Uh, Rindrek and Helen Hester on uh, platform capitalism, um, the riders that are not paid, um, the deliveroos, um, Airbnb, Uber, illegal organizations, um, the four big tech giants um, who don't pay tax, and um, Google. Amazon, they're now trillions of dollars. The, they are as bad as the Rockefellers and the Guggenheims. The, the, it's as bad as the first capitalism in terms of hegemony, in absolute, um, in a sense, yeah, illegality. And these people don't pay tax, so they have to be called to order. The European Union is calling Google and Facebook to order. Um, they're also calling uh, Ryanair to order. These are organizations that are simply illegal. They do not do the right thing by the citizens. They don't pay their tax. Fiscality may be one of the great big issues here mm -hmm. for the new capitalism. Potestas. Um, uh, Laurent de Sutter looking at um, psychopharmaceutical capitalism together with Preciado, the, the consumption of Ritalin, Prozac, and mood control drugs 
as well as the other drugs. I know that I, I live in Holland, but in Amsterdam, cocaine is cheaper than a gin and tonic. Okay? Recreational drugs are the banality. And which one are we doing this weekend? Uh, I have a house in the Marche, La Costiera Romagnola, I don't have to tell you. Um, uh, so the whole drug substratum of this, the enormous disparity in access. So you can do potestas, um, and, and I think it's very important work, biopolitical, um, necropolitical, all the people that are dying, and the, the suicides, the, 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 the people drowning in the ocean, very interesting stuff. A, a whole new, uh, Melinda Cooper's, how do bodies intersect with the new technology, surrogacy, um, is that the new prostitution? A question mark, huge debate in Italy with, with uterine affitto and all of that. Um, so there are, there are massive, there is, there is room here for a radically new gender studies program um, uh, that would also take up your second question. How does traditional feminist politics of location, including Spivak's Deridian positionality, relate to contemporary, more indigenous perspectivism? How can we make an alliance there? Um, um, and then last but not least, your last question, so very important on refugees. The idea that um, refugees and asylum seekers are not problems, but actual carriers of values and culture. I'll give you just three examples. One, a bit autobiographical. My partner and I, Annika and I, have set up a foundation that gives scholarship to women um, and who, anybody who calls themselves a woman. So the trans are uh, included in that. Um, we, the bulk of the money will come after we die. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so we have already started giving up through savings and we're looking for donations. If anybody has money to spare, send it in. So we started giving up money and we, we, we always choose some refugees, women, and some nationals. And we are now at the third year. And if you go on my website, you can see the ceremony. And this, the, the acceptance speech of one of our uh, uh, girls, Layal, who just sits there and says, I am so sick of being called a social problem. I have a degree in economics. I just happen to come from Syria. Give me a chance. So if anybody who works with these people see that we, we have an issue here that is so misrepresented. But two other examples, Marina Warner, who received the Holberg Prize a couple of years ago, has started a program in Sicily with the refugees. Um, I think it's called Literature in Transit. And she writes narratives and makes culture with the refugees. Go to the website and go and have a look. Many universities are collaborating with it. They call it world literature, and it is world literature. And it approaches the refugees as writers, novelists, people who come with a huge culture. They are not just a social problem. Last example from Australia, the biggest literary prize in Australia this year was given to a refugee who still is on Manus Island. And if you are an wow. illegal refugee on Manus Island, you will never be allowed out. You will never be allowed into Australia. Um, Baruch is his name. And he tweeted out his novel to a friend in Sydney who happened to be a student and came to our classes to what Paul Gilroy and I did a few years ago. Genevieve Lloyd, my BA supervisor, uh, is assisting them. The guy in Sydney translated the novel and adjusted it. It became No Friends But the Mountains, who got the top literary award in Australia. It's about to come out in the UK. An extraordinary book where the refugee locked up in the prison, in the incarceration system, looks at Australia and basically says, you think that I am the prisoner and you are free? Who is free here? You locked up in your fear, in your xenophobia, in your littleness. I'm the one here who actually is seeking freedom. An extraordinary reversal, extraordinary novel, No Friends But the Mountains, and examples of returning the gaze. And, and you know, refugees look at us, 60 five million people in the world is not a social problem. It's a new regime of living together, one that needs to be governed and negotiated. Racism is not the answer, particularly considering that the numbers of the refugees is decreasing so dramatically. We are creating here a nightmare for ourselves. We are incarcerating ourselves. And on top of it, as an Italian who's been a migrant since, since the age of 15, 
I want to remind everybody that there are over 50 million Italians in the world and that we Italians needed the hospitality of every single culture in the world. You would think we would have the decency of returning the courtesy and not indulging in this cheap racism that does not do justice of who we are or what we are capable of becoming, Mr. Salvini. <laughs> I hope you leave the raspberry in. Um, okay, so... Uh, performative not, enough. It's very performative, <laughs> <laughs> very performative. No, no, è interessante anche questo perché hm, dal punto di vista del, dell'arte, cioè noi siamo in un museo, no? Dal punto di vista dell'arte le cose non sono così. Semplici, cioè mh, mi viene da dire non sono così complesse e non sono così semplici. E, nel senso che Morandi, eh, isolato nel suo studio a Bologna, che dipinge bottiglie dipinte, ha una potenza, eh, diciamo, chiamiamola libertaria, attraverso il senso di distacco da quello che era quella società. Ehm, che, che ha una sua efficacia. Cioè, stavo solo, solo pensando al fatto che la maggior parte degli artisti che agiscono in maniera molto univoca, eh, nel senso di affer affermativamente issue based, cioè noi abbiamo vissuto adesso 15 anni o 20 anni di arte basata sul documentario, eh, diciamo un documentario parallelo, antagonista a quello che erano le informazioni date da, da CNN o da altri e gli artisti avevano preso la parola o, o, di, diventando ac, artivist, a, activist artist e di fatto questo periodo non ha portato quel periodo, quel periodo non ha portato a maggiore democrazia o giustizia nel mondo in, assolutamente no ha portato ad una sorta di falsa coscienza a mio parere per moltissimi visitatori di mostre grandi internazionali, biennali, eccetera, mentre eh, la, la, la potenza dell'arte è spesso nell'essere non chiara nel, nel suo, nella sua posizione, cioè nell'avere una fondamentale ambivalenza e ambiguità, per cui non capisci se Giorgio De Chirico sta agendo eh, in senso contrario all'accelerazione Ehm, dei, di, 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 quei, di quei mondi che hanno portato alla prima guerra mondiale la sua partenza degli argonauti questo neoclassicismo subito successivo al, alla guerra, alla prima guerra mondiale oppure l'astrattismo che sviluppa Kandinsky eh, su, subito prima della guerra e poi dopo Kandinsky parlava di questa inner necessity e in questo era rivoluzionario perché poneva la possibilità di, questa, di, un, di un valore all'interno di quello che noi chiamiamo atteggiamenti interiori, moti interiori eh, assolutamente embodied, ma eh, questi, eh, emotivi in, che ha una rivoluzionarietà, forse un'efficacia anche maggiore rispetto a George Gross o ad altri dadaisti che non hanno assolutamente avuto un effetto politico di miglioramento della società. Per cui quando ascoltavo e dicevo, Rosy Braidotti è letta da molti artisti, read, però il modo di agire può essere totalmente all'apparenza lontano, cioè le, chi è il Morandi di adesso, chi è la persona che si tira fuori da quel mondo che stava creando la bomba atomica, da quel mondo del, durante il fascismo in Italia e che apparentemente, o e chi è quel De Chirico che apparentemente sembra così lontano dall'essere engagé, eppure è, 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 chi, chi, la più grande critica all'ingenua idea di progresso è stato De Chirico più che, più che altri e, più che altri, e, e non, non è possibile pensare you know, a Deleuze senza Nietzsche ovviamente 
e, e Nietzsche che si mette a comporre musica negli ultimi anni dopo, dopo Torino o a studiare le abitudini sessuali delle aquile ehm, lo fa come un radicale tirarsi fuori e questo radicale tirarsi fuori è, è a volte la cosa più ehm, più umanistica nel senso di più vicina a quel, a quel agire in sintonia anche con il modo in cui una pianta gira eh, da un'altra parte dal cemento e cerca la luce da un'altra parte a quell'intelligenza che va molto di moda adesso delle piante che ci possa essere eh, e quindi forse noi nel nostro universo cioè nel, nel hito dire nel hito dire io pongo la domanda quanti angeli danzano sulla punta di un ago, punto e stop, vi pongo questa domanda e voi vedete. E, e a volte dal punto di vista del, dell'agire nel campo nostro, nel settore nostro più efficace paradossalmente dell'opera d'arte che spesso è, come sappiamo, falsa coscienza, insomma non, non so se Goya no, capisco, ha veramente cambiato dire. il mondo. Questo è importante, l'arte è un... un, un il tuo dominio, di fronte a te non oso dire nulla, però ho, ho dei, dei rapporti di lavoro molto stretti con molte artiste. Penso alla Patrizia Piccinini, sì. che è di Reggio Emilia, però è come me, emigrata in Australia. Mm -hmm. Siamo grandi amiche perché vive, vive adesso dove vivevo io da piccola, mm -hmm. a Melbourne. Anzi, penso che potremmo parlare di farla venire su serio. Um, favolosa, il suo lavoro su queste creature ibride, mm -hmm. um, che è profondamente umanista. Dice, io sono una neo-umanista che vuole accettare tutte queste nuove forme di vita eh, che la maggior parte della gente trova completamente disgustose, repellenti e, e brutte. Um, e il suo discorso su questo è molto molto interessante. Sì. E, e lei è una persona di grandissima interiorità, ha anche fatto ovviamente sì. tutte le scuole d'arte, eccetera. Uh, ma gli artisti nel senso di ricreare delle interiorità, delle singolarità, Penso sia essenziale, quando Deleuze dice non c'è differenza fra filosofia, scienza e arte, sono maniere differenti di avvicinarsi alle intensità che ci strutturano, sta facendo un parallelismo spedonista, però, spedonista ma anche portando al centro della discussione le intensità, le forze vitali, sono parole difficili perché il fascismo è passato di là e ha contaminato tutto, quindi dobbiamo mh, decontaminare e portare delle filosofie della vita all'interno di questo capitalismo cognitivo che ha fatto delle scienze della vita il suo capitale principale. L'operazione è questa, semplicissima, è tremenda. Perché io insisto sul fatto che la, la singolarità deve essere collettiva? Perché penso, ma questo è il mio ruolo di insegnante, è di diverso dal ruolo certo. di curatrice, che le tecnologie hanno portato l'esterno all'interno certo. della psiche e del vissuto, de, sicuramente dalle nuove generazioni. Non c'è differenza fra uno dei miei millennials e il loro telefonino, cioè la stessa cosa, possiamo attaccarli, infatti Nick eh, eh, Bostro dice attacchiamogli il chips nel cervello, è la stessa cosa, e di fatti si arriverà a questo tramite eh, tecnologie un po' più avanzate, ma insomma gli, gli artisti, penso al primo Stellark, sono già eh, anni che fanno questi esperimenti, mi metto il, il chips così mi, mi telefono eh, dalla mano, faccio aprire il frigo col migno, insomma ci sono queste cose anche abbastanza divertenti, um, ma, ma il fatto che questo, questo potere in intrusivo delle tecnologie, penso sarebbe ciò che impedirebbe a un Morandi d'oggi di essere la singolarità eh, che erano prima, non, almeno che uno, e questa è una, una forma adesso di, di, di ricerca, di studio, si va in luoghi dove non c'è internet, sta diventando oh, una nuova molti forma giovani. di ritiro sì, sì, fuori, sì. offline. Sì, yeah, molti giovani, eh, ma quando ma io... Ma eh, viene eh, un attacco di tofficaria, yeah, yeah, di astrofobia, non c'è segnale. Non stavo fa. intendendo una singolarità come prima, ovviamente. Cioè un Morandi oggi ha il suo cellulare, ovviamente. I mean, ne siamo attraversati. E se, se, e ci sono delle figure, Patrizia Piccinini ha una personalità, un nome, una famiglia, una vita, e, e, ed è attra... e, era più la mia una, una, uh, un, una riflessione, un'osservazione su un altro punto, che era che a volte quello che sembra lì per lì un lavoro d'arte eh, che, yeah, che possa avere un'efficacia immediata nella società ottiene esattamente l'opposto. E, e quello che invece lo ha, a volte, ehm, 
eh, può essere un fiore dipinto da Emil Nold nel, nel, nell'espressionismo, yes. per esempio. That's what I want to say. Con questo io desidero concludere, anche se forse, a meno che non c'è un'urgenza forte di dire qualcosa, or, eh, se no, I would call it a day, e grazie a voi per essere stati tutti qui, e spero che avrete occasione ancora aperto per un'ora al museo per vedere la mostra di Henri Sala eh, al terzo piano del castello e la mostra di Hector Steyer di qua. Bellissimo e l'omaggio a Harald Zeman al secondo piano e poi la Villa Cerutti che abbiamo aperto da pochi giorni <coughs> che, che raccoglie lavori eh, dal Medioevo veramente a oggi è una, un più grande gesto di messa in pubblico dell'arte da molto, molto tempo grazie, arrivederci